I want to talk to you today about your motivation for living. This is the first in a five-week series of messages called Christian Practice 301. Uh, turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 12. If you want to use our Bibles under the seats, it's on page 1137. Apostle Paul begins, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. God's mercy summarizes all that the Apostle Paul has said in the first 11 chapters. He starts off in the first couple chapters and he says, We can all know there's a God. How? You just look outside at how amazingly the universe works. The best explanation is that there's a designer behind it. Or we can all believe there's God because we notice that all human beings have a tendency to judge other people. Well, where did that come from? The idea that something that somebody's doing is wrong. I mean, a naturalistic world doesn't explain that. If there is no God and it's just nature and survival of the fittest, how do you get this sense of right and wrong? Well, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 2.14, God has written his law into every human being's heart. That's why people around the world cry for justice or speak out against injustice. We all have this sense. And what explains that? The best explanation is there's a God who gave us that. But we tend to reject God. We go our own ways. And so we sin against God. So then the Apostle Paul talks about God's love. He doesn't just leave us in our sin. He sends his son to die on the cross for our sins so we can be forgiven. His grace. Then in Romans 6 to 8, he talks about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives when we give our lives to Christ. He begins to renew us and remake us from the inside. Then in chapters 9 to 11, he talks about God's grace to the people of Israel. He hasn't rejected Israel. He still has a plan. Now we come to chapter 12. He says, in view of God's mercy, God's mercy is the basis for our practice. How we live naturally flows out of our understanding of how merciful God has been to us. He uses the Greek word oikthermon, mercies. It refers to God's mercy in sending Jesus to die for us. Here's Paul's point. The mercy of God motivates us to live for Christ. God has been good to us, so we're good to other people. Whether you're a teenager, young single, married, divorced, widowed, remarried, you have to understand God's mercy is your motivation for living. What motivates Christians to live good lives? Paul answers that whatever you do is done in response to God's mercy. Our sheer gratitude for God's mercy motivates us to live holy lives. This is a thanksgiving ethic. Thanksgiving to God for his mercy is what keeps your faith healthy. That's why the ethics advice in Romans 12 to 16 is so good. If you're having troubles in your life, check to see what your motivation for living is. Is it because of God's been merciful to you? Shortly after the Vietnam War, a man pulled into a gas station in uh, Arizona during a violent thunderstorm. Tenant came out whistling, filled up his car with gases. He gave him the credit card. He says, I feel so bad right, making you come out in this rain. He says, ah, no problem. I was in a foxhole in Vietnam, and I pray, God, if you get me home, I'll never complain the rest of my life. And I haven't. That's a thanksgiving ethic. That's what Paul's talking about here. God has done so much for me, I'm going to serve him with gratitude the rest of my life. The mercy of God motivates us to live for Christ. So how do we live motivated by God's mercy? Three ways. The first has to do with our bodies. Second has to do with our minds. Third has to do with our time. One, the mercy of God compels us to give him our bodies. Read Romans 12.1 with me. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
We're to offer our bodies to God, holy and pleasing. When archaeologists find first century Christian sites, they don't find all kinds of religious paraphernalia and fancy altars. Apostle Paul will have nothing to do with Christians walking around with secretive, spooky, uh, religious acts. He says, you offer God your body. That's all the religious act you have to do. That's what God receives. We don't have to do something fancy to get God's attention. He just wants us. We give him our bodies to, for his use in response to his mercy for us. The word offer is the Greek word peristomy. It means to yield oneself, offer oneself to, at someone's disposal, or dedicate it. It means to make ourselves available to God. It's the same word Paul uses in Romans 6.13. Read this with me. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So we make our eyes, our ears, our hands, our feet available to God. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The words Paul uses for true and proper worship are words that are used in Greek um, uh, mystery cults. We love to do religious acts. Everybody wants to do something religious. We're incurably religious. Paul says, make your body available to God as your living sacrifice. That's the only religious act you have to do. You don't have to do anything spooky, burn incense, perform some secret ritual. There are people in the world who have trained themselves to endure pain. Uh, some of them do it by uh, occultic power. Uh, some do it by mind over matter. There are people that have learned to uh, walk with bare feet over hot coals. There are people in Singapore that have learned to put long needles in their, in their muscles without wincing. They do this in hopes that this will impress God. You think that'll impress God? That doesn't impress God. You know why? Because putting a, a, a needle in your muscle takes it out of commission. God wants your body healthy. There are people that burn themselves out for God. They sacrifice their, their, their marriages and their children for, for serving God. God doesn't want you unhealthy. He wants you healthy. Suppose one of your children comes to you and says, I'm so tired and I'm feeling sick. Would you say, hey, get back up to your room and do your homework? Or get outside and mow the lawn? That would sound like me. No, you say, hey, it's okay. Take it easy. That's what God does for us. He's merciful. The mercy of God compels us to give him our bodies. Second, the mercy of God challenges us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. We have a choice. We're going to be conformed to the pattern of this world, like Dan was talking about. There are people wanting us to conform to the financial values of the world or be conformed to God's thinking. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If we're to ha behave differently from the world, we have to change. The problem is we can't change ourselves. We have to be transformed by the Holy Spirit working inside of us. Uh, the Greek word that Paul uses is metamorphomai, from which we get our word metamorphosis. A metamorphic rock is a rock that's changed in its in internal nature. The Holy Spirit changes us from the inside out. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, the renewal of our mind involves something we're not to do and something we're to do. The thing we're not to do, Paul suggests, is don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Let me ask you, how much time do you spend each week on, with screen time? Now, I'm not talking about you, that many of you, this is what you do for a living. You sit in front of a computer all day long. I'm talking about your personal time. How much time do you spend looking at emails and uh, uh, texts, um, maybe looking up things on the Internet or buying things or researching stuff 
uh, maybe, you know, what are, what are you on? Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. Uh, you know, how much, how much time do you spend watching uh, TV shows on your phone or movies? Or how about television? How much time do you watch watching sports or news or reality shows or programs? Do you think all that time is renewing your mind? Probably not. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. Um, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Then you'll know God's grand design to know Christ, to be conformed to Christ, and to share Christ. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do we renew our minds? It's by reading our Bible or using our journal. You know, I talk about this almost every week. We need to be doing something between Sundays to renew our mind or using another journal uh, or reading material that, you know, is, is going to build our faith. When we took a survey a month ago, 84% of us said the number one thing that keeps us from reading the Bible or using a journal is that we're too tired and too busy. I get that. But if we have time to look at this, Screen time, but we don't have time for God's word. It's not a matter of time and being too tired. It's a matter of priorities. Do you want your mind renewed by the Holy Spirit? The mercy of God compels us to offer him our bodies. It challenges us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And third, the mercy of God compels us to give our time to serve God. <laughs> For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Just as in a physical body you have an eye and an ear, you have a hand and your foot, they perform different functions, but they're both part of the same body. So, in the body of Christ, we all have different abilities, but we're all needed. Now, Paul lists some spiritual gifts God gives his people. Parents, help your kids understand their spiritual gifts. We have tests in our office. Uh, we, can, we can give you, or you can access these online. If your kids begin serving in an area where they're gifted, they will be energized. Think of a car that the more you drive it, the more it gets filled up with gas. If you're working in a profession where you're gifted, if you're serving in a ministry where you're gifted, you'll never have to work another day of your life. So the first one he lists is prophecy. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a person's gift is prophesying, let them use it in proportion to their faith. Uh, prophets uh, communicate uh, God's word to us, how it relates to our times. Uh, they foretell the future. Service, if it's serving, then serve. Uh, the gift of service is, is the gift of just meeting practical needs. It's almost synonymous with the gift of helps, helping out wherever you can. Danny Meyer spoke at this summer's uh, Leadership Summit. And in his book, uh, Setting the Table, he, uh, Danny uh, runs like 12 restaurants in New York City. And uh, he tells how uh, 12 people came in to uh, uh, his restaurant, 11 Madison Park, uh, during the Republican National Convention in 2004. And uh, it was people like uh, Tom Brokaw, uh, Johnny uh, Apple from uh, New York Times, Maureen Dowd, uh, Todd Purim, and his wife, Dee Dee Myers, who was the former press secretary for uh, Bill Clinton. And... Uh, they sat down at 11.45 after the convention of the day and uh, began a five-course meal. At 1 o'clock, Danny Meyer was getting ready to go, and he came out to see them, and he says, if you guys stay much longer, I'm going to have to uh, cook you up some scrambled eggs. And Johnny says, I can tell you're a Midwest boy. Uh, he grew up in Akron, Ohio, and uh, Danny says, yeah, I learned about scrambled eggs late at night uh, at parties in St. Louis, where I grew up. And Johnny says, well, I bet you haven't heard of eggs daffodil. And Danny says, you know, you got me on that one. So as he left, he said to Carrie Hefferman, his head cook at that restaurant, he says, go online and check out eggs daffodil. And at 2 a.m., you bring a pot 
to them uh, with that. So he looked online. There wasn't a whole lot of information, but enough for him to figure it out. So he blended the eggs with cream and then fondue, and then he put in zucchini blossoms. At 2 a.m., brought out a big pot of eggs daffodil. Uh, Danny had said to him before he, he, he did that, he says, you know, if, if they say the word of mouth makes the world go around, these guys have a big word of mouth. They have a big platform. And uh, the next morning, he said to Carrie, how'd it go? And he said, the eggs daffodil blew them away. Uh, two years later, Danny uh, saw Tom Brokaw, and Tom Brokaw began to tell 12 people the story of the eggs daffodil at 2 in the morning. Uh, Danny says in his book, he said, if you ask Johnny anything about the meal they had that night, I guarantee you the thing that he'll remember is the eggs daffodil. That's service at its finest. Teaching is the next one. If it's teaching, let them teach. Teachers are people that instruct other people in the body of Christ from the scriptures. Exhortation. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Uh, people with the gift of uh, encouragement are, you know, are wonderful people. They thank people. They give compliments. Uh, they just say things that encourage people. Giving. If it is giving, then give generously. People blessed by God with material wealth don't have to see it as something tainted by the world, but as something that God has blessed them with so that they can propel kingdom causes to go forward. Uh, Danny Meyer uh, shared at the Leadership Summit this summer about an uh, a, a Italian clothier um, making a reservation for 16 at one of his restaurants. And they have a room in one of their restaurants that seats 18 in the up, upstairs. And so they got it all set up. And the day before, uh, the person called and said it'll be 24 of us. So they expanded the table, put in more chairs. And uh, when they showed up that next night, there were 34 of them. That room was totally stuffed. And, the, and the, uh, they had asked Danny to be part of their party. And so he sat there and watched as a waiter was clearing the table, picked up the bread basket. A lady had put the olive oil in the bread basket to make more room. And as this guy lifted it out, it poured all over this lady's beautiful suede dress. So Danny called Calvin Klein and they only had one suede dress in her size. He says it cost more than the price of the entire meal. And the next night, he had it hanging in her hotel room and uh, a basket with foods from his restaurants and a $500 gift certificate to come back to the restaurant. That's generous giving. Leadership <clears throat> is the next one. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Some are given the ability to lead. When leaders lead... Everybody does better because everybody gets involved using their gifts. Sometimes pastors think that when they're hired by a church, they're hired to do the ministry. But a far more valuable thing for them to do is to get other people involved doing the ministry with them. A gal in our church was mad at me and she says, I'm mad at you. I says, why is that? She said, I was in the hospital for four months and you only visited me four times. Now, this is a hospital outside of town. I thought I was doing great. I said, do you realize that while you were in there, I sent probably 20 people to see you? What gift was I using? Gift of leadership. I learned a long time ago that I'm not the only one that can visit people in hospitals. There are many people in the church can do, do that just as well or better than I can. We're having a uh, meeting this week, by the way. It's called, we started out calling it pastoral, pastoral care. Now we're calling it the Care and Crisis Team. And uh, this is our second meeting. If you're interested in this care and crisis, helping people that are sick or in hospitals or grieving, uh, we're going to meet at 11 a.m. Uh, this Wednesday. I'm very pleased about the people that have signed up. Um, uh, so I do a better job as a pastor, a greater service by not just doing everything, but by helping you do things and use your gifts. And then the last one he mentions is mercy. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Uh, people that uh, have the gift of mercy do a great job of, 
of, of serving other people, of visiting the sick. Um, they do things that are kind to people. A family visited the Ritz-Carlton in Amelia Island, and when they got home, they realized, oh, they'd forgotten their, their little boy's stuffed animal, a stuffed giraffe named Joshi. So the father called Ritz-Carlton and said, Can you, is, is Joshi there? Can you? And they, they looked, and he was in the room still. They said, we'll send it back to you. He says, could you do one more thing? Could you just take a photo of him so I can, sh you know, email it to us so I can show my boy he's okay? Well, they did one better than that. Two days later, when Joshi arrived in their house, inside with it, they had a photo album of what Joshi did at the resort <laughs> after they left. <clears throat> so here we have uh, Joshi by the pool, having a good time. And then uh, here he is. He's... Uh, Driving a golf cart at the beach. Who knew that Joshi could even drive? Here he is getting a massage at the spa. Had just living it up. And they even gave him a, a shift at the uh, computer security uh, board uh, watching out for the hotel. So isn't that great? <laughs> that photo album was a gift of mercy to that little boy. Paul tells us we each have different gifts to use in the body. God gives us important abilities to use for his kingdom causes. God doesn't give you every spiritual gift. You can't do everything. But you can do something. Each person has an important contribution to make. No one's unnecessary. Are you serving in some way at Portland Community Church? You serving somewhere during the week between Sundays? The mercy of God motivates us to offer him our bodies, compels us to give him our minds, and to give him our time. The mercy of God motivates us to live for Christ. Is that your motivation for living? Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul, inspired by you, your Holy Spirit, that you want us to give us, give you our bodies, our minds, and our time. And we all do it, not out of duty, not to impress you, but in response to your mercy. You've been so merciful to us, sending your son to die for us. We want to serve you. You want to tell God that right now in a prayer? If you've never committed your life to Christ, you could do it right now. Say, thank you for your mercy to me. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. All of you, just a, a short prayer to God, thanking him for his mercy and telling him you want to serve him in response this week. Lord God, thank you that you can hear all of our prayers at once. I just don't even get it. And we thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.